What kind of world do I want to live in? I think about this question a lot. For our generation and for specifically my group of people, which is refugees, the circumstances might dismantle any vision of the future that we have. You're trying to rebuild, you're trying to make a future for yourself, and then the climate related disaster comes and you start again. It's not about how it's affecting you now, it's about how it's affecting you your entire life. First step to understand is that we're all a part of it. None of us are going to be left out by the crisis. We're at a stage where if we don't act now, really there won't be very much left. There are generations that will never see certain things that we grew up seeing in real life. We have to start treating this like the emergency it is. To achieve the 17 Sustainable Development Goals, we have to go from an intention to a serious commitment. Business leaders really need to rethink how they conduct their business and invest in creating systems that are climate friendly. I would like to see is accountability. Structures being put in place where countries aren't just asked to do something, but they're kept accountable to the decisions that they make. There has to be that strong collaboration between government, between corporations, between youth activists to drive change forward. The world I would want to live in is a world where imagining the future is not a privilege. I want to live in a world where people do not give up on hope, hope that a positive change is possible. The fact that you're listening today means that you are willing to make a change. Welcome, everyone. My name is Tom Perriello. I'm the executive director of the Open Society Foundation for the U.S., and I'm extremely uh, excited to be with this amazing set of women leaders on the issues of trade, social justice, and the movement of people. Uh, the roots of trade policy did not come out of a moment of uh, idealism or hypothetical academic discussion. It came out of the carnage of world wars and of Great Depression. And from that, there was a belief that trade could be not just a mechanism for somehow maximizing the volume of trade, but actually was an important component of building kind of social cohesion and raising of the floor of conditions uh, that would prevent that kind of human carnage we've seen in the past. We're now coming out of and facing a series of extremely serious challenges. We have a global pandemic. We are well into a decade of the worst refugee crisis uh, since we began recording numbers, probably in human history, uh, which could be exacerbated by some recent conflicts that continue to grow. And we have a climate crisis whose impacts are being felt in many of the most vulnerable parts of the world. We've also seen uh, an inspiring movement for liberation for justice, for equality, including the movement for Black Lives in the United States, indigenous movements around the world, uh, Me Too movements, and others. We see right now a moment not unlike that after World War II in which we're asking the question, what is it we want to accomplish with our trade policy? How is it that we want to affect lives? Is it the end in itself, or is it a means? And to the extent it is, has it been uh, actually reducing inequality with an eye towards issues of race, gender, and ethnicity? Or where has it been actually part of exacerbating that problem? Where is this something that's driving geographical uh, inequalities that create and undermine social cohesion in countries? We see a global economy whose fragility has been shown not just to come from barriers to trade, like tariffs and non-trade non barriers, but from issues of failed states, of issues of exclusion from the economy for entire categories of the population. 
And we have an amazing set of three leaders to talk to us about these challenges and these opportunities. I'm excited to be joined by Angelica Romero, the General Director of Multilateral Economic Affairs for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Chile. We have Pamela Coke Hamilton, the Executive Director of the International Trade Center, and Penelope Naz, the President for International Public Affairs and Sustainability at UPS. And we are excited to dive into this topic. But before we do, I'd like to invite all of you to click on the link in the chat to answer a quick poll question on Slido to see where our audience stands on the question, should trade policy attempt to address inequalities between different social groups? One for yes, two for no, or three for I'm unsure. Should trade policy attempt to address inequalities between different social groups? One yes, two no, three I'm unsure. What I'd like to do now is open it up to this group of global leaders uh, to give us some thoughts on this range of topics, including what they face uh, in either their institutions as a mission or their countries. And I'll st start with you, Angelica. Chile has certainly had a, a dynamic few years, um, uh, the last few years, and your government has been a very strong advocate for incorporating uh, a gender perspective into trade policy. Can you elaborate a little bit on both Chile's experience of this in their own country, but also in uh, trade policy on the issues of gender equality? Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Thomas. Uh, uh, good evening to everyone, uh, to you, to Pamela, Benny, and also Shen, who is with us. It is uh, really a pleasure to be with you in this panel tonight. Uh, on behalf also, I want to give the, the greetings from our Vice Minister of Trade, Mr. Rodrigo Yanez. Um, and it, it really represents a great opportunity to share with you and also with the audience, you know, Chile's ambitious uh, and forward-looking, you know, uh, gender and trade agenda. Uh, over the past year, Chile has been working to ensure that the benefits of trade are more widely shared, as well as promoting a more resilient, sustainable, inclusive uh, global trade. And, and this is you know, very, very important and more important than ever because um, of all the social and economic challenges that the pandemic has brought uh, globally and the disproportionate impact it has had on women and also uh, on girls. Uh, the COVID-19 crisis has uh, deepened inequality of every kind. And for example, in, in Chile, in our country, uh, the extreme poverty increased almost, you know, 5% in households. Uh, headed by women during the, the pandemic. And today we have a, an opportunity to assess what we have been achieved so far and introduce you know, some new initiatives uh, that promote gender equality in trade. The CCIP policies action was and still is needed to push forward uh, those in innovative uh, policies that are gender sensitive and that facilitate women's uh, economic empowerment. So in the case of Chile, we have been, you know, working uh, or mainstreaming a, a gender perspective in our trade policies by implementing gender and trade chapter in several uh, free trade agreements. We included our first chapter uh, on gender and trade uh, with Uruguay in 2016, you know, and after that, uh, Canada, uh, followed by uh, Argentina, Brazil, uh, and Ecuador. Uh, uh, and as Pamela is uh, aware, a recent uh, IPC study showed, you know, that FTA uh, with gender provision are building blocks for larger and more integrated markets, and they open opportunities in, in global value chain. And this is very, very important. For uh, another concrete uh, action that uh, we took, you know, is uh, together with Canada and New Zealand uh, last year, we signed the Global Trade and Gender Arrangement that it is called GITAGA also. And, and it's part of the inclusive trade action group that we have uh, with these uh, countries. The arrangement promotes mutually supportive uh, trade and gender policies and represents a commitment to unlock uh, new opportunities to increase women's participation in trade as part of the broader export to improve this gender equality. And it, it, it is also important to mention that this uh, GITAGA, you know, it, it is open and uh, we can, uh, new members could join to this uh, arrangement. 
Uh, uh, also in uh, 2019, you know, uh, during Chile's host year for APEC, uh, the La Serena Roadmap for Women and Inclusive World uh, uh, Growth was endorsed. And the purpose of this uh, document is to look, you know, for greater integration and the empowerment of women in the Asia Pacific by 2030. Uh, today, you know, we have the policy partnership on women and the economic group that has led the implementation of this roadmap, making successful progress in streaming the gender approach. 16 groups have, has, have developed, uh, uh, you know, this process of implementing more than 100 initiatives that respond to the priorities identified in the roadmap. And in 2020, last year, you know, uh, we also launched the roadmap for the autonomy and uh, economic empowerment of women in the Pacific Alliance. This is, you know, uh, Chile as a coordinator of the gender technical group in the Pacific Alliance is leading, you know, the implementation of this roadmap and uh, around 30 projects uh, that we proposed by different working groups uh, within the uh, Pacific Alliance are implementing during this year and also uh, next year. And we have been also very engaged in the discussion, you know, in the WTO, particularly the informal working group on trade and gender, that it is building on the Buenos Aires Declaration for Women Empowerment in 2016, 2017, uh, sorry, and also the OECD that has proposed, you know, a, an analytical framework to evaluate the effects of uh, trade policies on women. And this is very important because we need to uh, we need this input, this data in order to know the impacts that we are having, you know, uh, in the formulation of gender sensitive public policies. So Chile has been very, very actively, you know, alongside with the OECD, with the WTO, with APEC, Pacific Alliance, and, and or, or in other forests. And we think, you know, that these are very concrete action in order to promote, to advance in the fulfillment of uh, women's full participation in trade. And we will continue to work on that path, you know, uh, since we know that this is the only way to, you know, really uh, find this uh, truly inclusive trade system. And of course, we are confident that we will get there. Uh, and uh, of course, this kind of discussion is very, very useful uh, to uh, move things uh, toward that uh, achievement. Thank you so much for that. And when I come back, I'd really love for you to speak a little bit more about looking at questions of inequality among women, where you're looking at issues of class and education level uh, and race and ethnicity and how we make sure that that's being addressed also within this uh, context as you see it in Chile uh, when I come back to you. So I just wanted to tee that up. Pamela, uh, I know ITC has been working on measuring progress in trade and gender policies and would love to hear from you just an overview of what works and what doesn't and what are some of the key factors uh, that really make sure trade policy is inclusive. Thank you so much, Thomas, and, and hi to Angelica and to Penny. Great seeing you guys. Um, thanks for the opportunity to share on this really critical topic of making trade policies truly inclusive from a gender perspective. The International Finance Corporation estimates that one in three businesses are owned by women. Yet they have on average lower sales and assets and often operate in saturated low profit sectors and markets. Additionally, 70% of women-owned SMEs in developing countries are underserved or not served by financial institutions. We're all feeling the brunt of COVID in multiple ways, but if there's one group which has been especially hard hit, it is women. We're seeing higher employment losses for women globally, 5% for women compared to 3.9 for men, according to the ILO. And women-owned businesses across multiple countries are also experiencing higher closure rates, which are in part due to them operating in sectors which were impacted by the pandemic, such as hospitality and tourism, and in particular, the country I come from and the region that I come from, the Caribbean. However, this was also due to what has been coined as the care crisis, which intensified when nearly 90% of countries closed schools increasing the time women spent in unpaid care work. And so within this context, ensuring gender considerations are taken into account in trade policies is a must if we want men and women to benefit equally. 
we need to promote fair and inclusive policies in one of the major aspects of our work. And I want to mention what Angelica said about including uh, gender uh, provisions in their trade agreements. This is critical, and it's one of the recommendations that came out of our, our guide. Our flagship program, the She Trades Initiative, is dedicated to working directly with women entrepreneurs to improve their export competitiveness, while also addressing obstacles in the ecosystem which are hindering sustainable and inclusive trade. The She Trades approach to gender data is twofold. We've developed and deployed firm level business surveys to help capture information at the grassroots level. And through these surveys, we can understand what women export and the types of barriers they face. At the same time, through the She Trades Outlook, ITC's policy tool on women and trade, we're also able to create a bird's eye view of the policy ecosystem in a country in order to examine data gaps, identify the areas for policy reform, and share good practices across countries. To date, the She Trades Outlook includes 38 countries across and 80 good practices. So coupled with in-house technical assistance, we're also able to take this work one step further and actually provide countries with tailored support for inclusive policy reform. We have supported over 10 countries on topics ranging from national trade policies to public procurement to COVID-19 disbursement packages. Given our experience, there are a few key lessons we can share about what works well to create transformational change. The first is that data matters. Countries that put in place frameworks and mandate collection of gender data on a regular basis tend to do better at creating more conducive ecosystems for women. Regrettably, the data landscape is fragmented, making it difficult to get a good picture of many aspects of women's participation in trade. Data collection should be complemented with improved consultation mechanisms to give women's associations a voice on policies that affect them. Secondly, government commitment is key. The first step to effect actual change is for our government to recognize the role of trade in supporting gender equality. Joining the Buenos Aires Declaration on Women and Trade is an important step in this direction. Thirdly, big picture plans are important. Taking the effort ahead to develop an inclusive policy is essential. However, a policy that sits on a shelf will do no good. From the beginning of the policymaking process, it's useful to keep in mind what the implementation will look like, as well as have communication and m and &E plans in place. The fourth lesson is to avoid working in silos. When it comes to women's economic empowerment, there may be many institutions that play an important role. For example, the Ministry of Trade, Education, Gender, Finance, and so on. Especially with respect to consultations and development of action plans, raising awareness among these actors and ensuring their involvement will increase their buy-in and cooperation in the long term. Lastly, we need to adopt uniform terms related to women's entrepreneurship. It's important to define what it means to be a woman entrepreneur, woman-led, or woman-owned business in order to collect the relevant data, determine beneficiaries for programs, and define the target groups for policies. ITC, the ISO, and the Swedish Institute of Standards have worked with more than 350 stakeholders to develop global definitions during this uh, this issue. So I think I'll stop there for now, but thank you so much. And I, I, I'm open to discussing what other measures we can look at and how we can drill down deeper. Thank you. Thanks so much, Pamela. Um, Penny, what actions can companies take to contribute to gender equality and where can government policy uh, assist? Thank you so much. And first, I just want to start by saying how humbled I am to be with my two co-speakers today. I have the opportunity to partner with both of them and their governments on various initiatives, some of which they've discussed today. And I just have to say that they are true leaders in, uh, in the topics we're talking about today. And it's fantastic to be, um, but a bit humbling to be on the stage with them today. Um, when I think about what companies can do and where we can contribute. Um, I think of four areas in which we, we intersect with our, our populations and our citizens. So first is our employees. So the first thing ever, I think that companies can do is really to think about diversity in their workforce and ensuring that 
uh, their workforce is not only diverse, but diverse kind of at all levels. And so I think that's something that's a very important consideration. I happen to be in a company that our CEO is a, is a woman and um, it, it, she's a fantastic businesswoman and financial wizard, but, um, but also brings a different perspective to the role that I think is, um, is critical. And having diversity in your workforce and in your management ranks is incredibly important. Second is in terms of customers. And so we do a lot of work. We do a lot of work with Pamela at the ITC to work with companies around the world to help them um, understand and to grow their businesses and then potentially to export. Now, some of these people will be our customers and some of the work we do is via our foundation. And while the work through our foundation is incredibly important, it's capacity building, it's, it's helping out businesses that may or may not be potential UPS customers in the future. What does help us is when we do work with businesses that do become our customers. And I think of that as being truly about sustainable development. Because if what we really wanna do is promote more, um, more uh, women in trade and women in business and women business leaders, working with them and having them be successful and having them become our customers, it moves away from our foundation arm and moves into our core business. And then it becomes truly sustainable because it becomes good business to do business with them. So, so second is your customers and, and making sure you're doing everything you can to diversify your customer base as well. A third area where I see where companies can come um, and have a role in terms of kind of gender equality and, and particularly in trade is their suppliers. And looking at your global value chain, your global supply chain, and diversifying it. Um, I was on calls today, just here in our company, talking about some of our suppliers around the world and asking the questions of, are we looking not only at growth and this and that, but are we also looking at the diversity of the suppliers we're bringing in from a broad perspective? In the past 18 months, two years, we've seen how important diversity is, geographic, industry, et cetera, uh, in terms of building resilient supply chains, building resilient um, supply locations. And I think that looking at and ensuring you have diversity in your supply chain is incredibly important. We know that the most resilient ecosystems in nature are those that are diverse. And if you have a diverse supply chain, diverse supply base, it's going to help you with your resilience. Finally, I think the other area or the last area we can look at is investors. So we, um, as large companies, we also sometimes invest our capital or invest our cash in places. And I think there are opportunities to look at how to use our, um, how to use our financial uh, strength to also ensure that our money is being invested and placed in places where it can not only generate a return, but can also contribute socially to some of the goals that we're looking at as companies. I think about um, one of my icons is Dolly Parton. I think Dolly Parton in the last 18 months can do no wrong. And I thought it was really interesting to hear how she took the proceeds of the money she made off the song, I Will Always Love You, that Whitney Houston remade, and invested those proceeds in property in parts of Nashville, Tennessee that were um, economically disadvantaged. And she thought that, that not only was it a good investment, but it was, it was being a good corporate citizen to make those investments and was an appropriate investment of that money. So when I look at all of those four things that we look at in business, and I think about government and the role that business and government can play together, I see a lot of opportunities for government policies to, to have um, intersections and to not only provide partnership opportunities between government and business, but also to put in place some of the nudges we might want to see with regards to some of these policies. So for example, you know, a lot of governments, the US government where I currently sit has some policies in place around, um, around supply chains and around sourcing. And they've put in place for the US government some requirements around minority and women-owned businesses and having certain percentages that they, will in, that they will hire and, in, and encourage in government supply chains. 
And so things like that, and I think policies like that are extremely helpful to put in place the right pushes and nudges above and beyond, I think the policies that Pamela has talked about and Angelica has talked about earlier um, in the panel. Thank you so much for that. Thanks, Penny. I think it's worth noting, if I can take the privilege, that uh, you know UPS has been seen as a very pro-worker company as well, um, and that has really served them well through this pandemic. When some other companies and in similar industries have taken hits, both brand hits and stoppage hits, and I think it's a good example of this question of like whether raising the floor for workers really does ultimately create not just good brand equity, but good economic resilience. And so certainly UPS's uh, efforts in that regard are worth, worthy of note. Uh, Pamela, coming back to you, you know, I think the question is, is there a game changer right now on trade in terms of inclusion and equality? Gender, we're talking about a lot here, so you can focus on that, or we can look at ethnicity and race. But, you know, we've been kind of doing things the same way for a few decades, and the economy doesn't look like the economy of the 1990s anymore. And a lot of the kind of politics of what we see and, and the, the demoses that we see look different. Um, what does it look, what would it mean to think really differently? Um, and should we about the issue of how trade can be used to, to advance equality around gender and race and ethnicity? Well, thanks so much, Thomas. I mean, the truth is we have to change the game. Right? We have to change the game simply because if we continue doing what we always do, we'll end up getting what we've always gotten. And so we have to understand that, particularly in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic, so much has changed and so dramatically and so quickly that we need to actually step in now and do what needs to be done to actually in, in, in put this game-changing um, provisions. So, you know, to understand what could potentially be game-changing, we also need to know the landscape that we're occupying. And one of the good things is that the International Gender Champion Trade Impact Group and the Buenos Aires Declaration placed the trade and the gender agenda firmly on the table and led to the establishment of the WTO Informal Working Group. And we hope that this is just the beginning. There's been a lot of momentum building at the multilateral trade and gender level, but the new normal demands a bolder ecosystem approach that engages a broad coalition of stakeholders nationally, regionally, and internationally. So the WTO Informed Working Group is currently developing its MC12 deliverables. I can't say what there is to expect, but I can surely share with you what I think should happen at MC12 and beyond. I think, first of all, we need to ensure for developments in Geneva and at MC12 result in real change on the ground. And this will imply concrete deliverables in terms of political commitments to set up the initiatives to support women entrepreneurs and women producers, but also additional aid for trade resources, especially for developing countries, to enable them to implement these programs. I also want to encourage countries to join the She Trades Outlook. I hope that the MC12 deliverable will recommend members to adopt it as the G7 trade ministers have done. Secondly, we need to foster greater linkages and intersectionality in the trade and gender space. At the International Gender Champions Trade Impact Group, ITC, along with co-chairs Iceland and Botswana, are also proposing a private-public partnership component to our new work plan. And this work plan is under review at this time, but I think it will be a very important game changer and I know Penny will be on board, so we look forward to working with you on updates in the coming months. And then when it comes to trade and gender, we need to look more at cross-cutting issues and promote women as agents of change in the circular economy, in digitalization, and across the board. We know that women are seriously underrepresented, for example, in technology, and algorithms have been built using data which are inherently biased. And so if we know where the economy is now and where it's heading towards, then it becomes all the more urgent that we double down on efforts to close the digital gender gap now. And thirdly, we need to better understand how to mainstream gender into the WTO and into international trade by leveraging WTO bodies and processes. This will bring the trade and gender into the heart of the multilateral trading system. I know it's extremely ambitious and it requires not only expertise and partnerships, but also a mindset change, but I think it can happen. And ITC, with the support of the European Union, is working on a gender lens framework as it pertains to the WTO. And this requires several months, so we should reasonably expect that it will be discussed at MC13. But I do believe that 
it is time for the game to change. I think we can do it with the kind of cooperation that we have and the fact that, you know, we have people like Penny and Angelica on the on this panel. I think we can leverage uh, the goodwill and the recognition that women gender is a serious issue and that women have suffered the most during this COVID-19 crisis. Thanks. Thank you, Pamela. And when I come back, I think it'd be useful to understand what folks outside, you know, we started this panel with that beautiful video of the younger generation um, wanting to demand more of trade to, to get your advice to them on what is useful and what's not useful in terms of advancing the chances that something like that uh, game changer approach could could uh, see the light of day and, and become successful. So we'll come back on that. But Angelica, um, you know, I briefly had a, a mural up behind me of essential workers, which I meant to have from the beginning, and I was told I'm not allowed to add in the middle. But you know, it was a time during COVID where we really saw a different face of workers, um, including of women workers, and that this was not this was about entrepreneurs, but we also saw nurses and teachers and construction workers and restaurant workers have a very different um, kind of sense of being what came to be known as essential in this. And so I'm curious with you how we make sure the gender work we're doing on trade, make sure all women are seen um, in, uh, in this process. And then along with that, you know, what other aspects of inclusive trade um, is Chile trying to advance uh, beyond the issues of gender that are so important? Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for those questions. Well, with, with regard to to, to you know to to work with different uh, type of, uh, of of women that lead different sectors and and it is very important something that uh, um, Pamela uh, uh, told us you know the the work uh, with the other ministries you know this is very important because uh, in in that regard you could you could work with, uh, uh, you know, the Ministry of Education, the Ministry of uh, Labor, uh, the Ministry of uh, Gender, you know, and, uh, and uh, uh, equity. So uh, it is very important to, to see what uh, with, we can do, you know, together in order to um, uh, bridge those gaps, you know, and uh, support the women, uh, not only in trade, but also in other aspects, you know, and, and there is also elements on digitalization, uh, education, and uh, areas such as science. Uh, so that's why, for example, the roadmap is very broad, not only the, the uh, Pacific Alliance uh, roadmap we are working on, but also the APEC, you know. So I think uh, those uh, those things, the work that we do internally, domestically, you know, with the ministries, but also the work and the, the, the experience that we can share with partners are very, very important. With regard to the other aspects of uh, inclusive trade, let me tell you that um, we, don't, we do not only work on, on you know, the inclusion of, of of women, but also uh, we want, you know, to address other issue, uh, issues such as uh, uh, SMEs, you know, MSMEs uh, particularly, and uh, indigenous people. And um, we think uh, those we have, you know, it is important to mutually support uh, and uh, make a coherent trade, you know, with our domestic policies and try to remove those barriers, you know, the barriers that the, that are, you know, in trade and facilitate their integration into this uh, supply chain, the international trade. Uh, 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 so uh, we we have been working, and if you see in our FTA, we have a standalone chapter on MSMEs. You know, and in fact, if you see, you know, the figures, uh, MSMEs represent nearly, you know, the 90% of the business, businesses, and uh, it provides more than the 50% of the labor force. And if you see Chile, and, uh, you know, we have, a, you know, a wide network of FTA, but the Regrettably, let me tell you that uh, we have a very limited, you know, uh, MSMEs uh, exports, you know, only 1.6% uh, of the total companies uh, exported in uh, last year, for example. 
So in that sense, it is very important to focus, you know, the work in promoting their internationalization in, in you know, understanding what are the problems they have, you know, reducing the regulatory barriers, supporting them in improving the access to, to finance, you know, strength the capacity uh, to use, you know, digital platform, e-commerce. Uh, in fact, you know that the, uh, uh, Chile has recently uh, joined the, the DEPA, you know, that is the Digital Economy Partnership Agreement. So uh, we try to include the uh, MSMEs in different bilateral trade agreements, uh, CPTPP, uh, with Argentina, with Uruguay, with uh, Brazil, with Ecuador. But not only, you know, uh, MSMEs, we, we try also to approach indigenous people in trade policy. And we don't, we don't have, you know, specific uh, chapters or provision in our FTAs, uh, but we consider, you know, that uh, 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 there are some cooperation areas in, in which we contemplate, you know, supporting economic uh, opportunities for rural and indigenous women. And, and this is the case, for example, with the GITAGA, the Global Trade and Gender Arrangement, you know, that has this, uh, this area of cooperation, or in CPTPP, in which we have, you know, an area of, uh, you know, uh, co cooperation uh, provision on area of traditional knowledge, traditional cultural. So uh, we have that kind of, of provision. And uh, we also have, you know, the Export Promotion Bureau that um, prioritizes, you know, in its uh, work program, uh, the support of uh, the companies that are, uh, you know, owned by uh, indigenous people. So since uh, 2015, Pro Chile has developed this program and uh, is supporting, you know, uh, different indigenous people communities in Chile to promote their products, their services, you know, internationally. So we we find that the you know that is the way we need to evolve you know to you know work as capacity building mentorship training marketing management you know and uh, support in a more broad way you know uh, indigenous people to have access to international trade and uh, through that you know to the benefits uh, that we have uh, through our uh, FTA so we strongly believe that MSMEs women indigenous people you know are the 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 persons we we need to support in order to ensure that trade you know uh, is supporting to have uh, also an inclusive uh, economic growth uh, for the countries thank you thomas Thank you so much. Coming back to you, Penny, you spoke some about uh, the power of diversity um, that e in terms of ecosystem resilience and business resilience. How can the private sector do more to contribute to racial equity and the protection of migrant workers uh, through trade uh, right now at this uh, tumultuous time? Yeah, so Pamela and I have the pleasure of co-chairing a group at the World Economic Forum that works on trade and investment. And we've recently put out a paper on this topic around social justice and racial equity and trade. I think that some of the principles I've already talked about with regards to the business community, ensuring that your supply chain is diverse, ensuring your customer base um, is diverse, and you're doing what you can to help diverse businesses expand their business, how you look at your own workforce, all of those are equally applicable when we think about the issues around um, broader diversity and some of the social justice issues in our in our day to day businesses. And um, some of the I think government policies also um, intersect and are very similar. But in our paper, we articulated a couple of specific areas whereby trade, in particular, could look at and potentially contribute to eliminating some of the discrimination or bias that we see in the world today when it comes to certain disadvantaged groups. And I think Pamela has already articulated that one aspect of that is data. Um, you almost need to shine a spotlight on some of it in order for people to understand. One thing that we've seen is that in, in some places, in Canada, for example, we work with indigenous populations. They're actually very successful at exporting, and um, there may be lessons to replicate in some of the programs that the government has put in place that may be something of interest to look at elsewhere. It's then looking at the rules. And when you look at the international trade rules, they're premised on non-discrimination. 
But the question is, how can we take that and move that even further? How can we maybe be a little bit more, in some cases, affirmative about the lack of discrimination or the elimination of discrimination in certain areas? So at the WTO, there's the domestic regulation uh, negotiations that are ongoing. These involve what I would call non-tariff barriers for services. And there, um, there's a provision that looks at eliminating discrimination in, uh, uh, for anybody that's in these trade agreements with regards to gender. So licenses and permits will not be able to be issued based on gender as a criteria. It's, it's a small, it may, it may sound small, because there's not a lot of them that are out there, but it's an important signal that gets sent with regards to discrimination will not be tolerated in these trade agreements. I think then it's looking at the inclusive practices. How do we ensure that all parts of the population are being included in terms of implementation of trade agreements and are able to take advantage of, of trade agreements? And I think that's a combination, again, of things like ITC and UPS's partnership with regards to capacity building and training and, and reaching out to communities who may not be reached via traditional networks, and, and then looking at and expanding certain government programs that have been used to help, um, to help with uh, promoting exports for certain parts of the population. And then again, kind of going back to starting with the data and ending with the data, making sure that you monitor and assess where things um, where things have landed after all of this and then tweaking where appropriate and where maybe the, the consequences haven't been um, as, as the, haven't pulled through in the way that was initially negotiated and desired. So those are just some of the ideas that our group has come up with on how to advance some of these racial equity issues, particularly using the trade rules moving forward. So before we transition over to the uh, off the record portion, Pamela, you were positively name checked there. So didn't know if you had anything you wanted to add uh, on this part. Oh, yeah, thank, thanks so much, Thomas. And thanks, Penny, uh, for, for highlighting um, our co-chairmanship and, and the paper that came out. Um, I mean, we could talk ad infinitum about this issue, but the issue of inclusion, um, not just with relation to gender, but in, in relation to the intersectionality of race. Um, as a black woman, I, I know in very specific terms the, the kinds of challenges that are faced, uh, not just from the perspective of being a woman, but also from the perspective of, of being a woman of color. Um, and so we need to also be 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 honest, um, if we want to talk about game changer, we have to start to drill down to the specific issues um, that affect uh, women and women of color in different ways uh, than those um, that are not women of color. It's just the reality. Um, and so even things like access to finance are, are bigger issues. Um, things like government government procurement contracts, which is a huge opportunity for many women, um, but can we uh, realistically engage in that? Um, indigenous women, you know, you look at the rate at which, um, you know, issues of, of um, non-inclusion in the economics of the society and then the, the, the rate of, of suicide. Um, and we begin to look at all the various elements. So that's, uh, you know, I don't want to go on, but I could. But <laughs> what I'm saying is that we need to be, we need to be, I think, um, ambitious. We need to be uh, honest, and we need to begin to be brave enough to challenge um, what has continued to be a, a very dysfunctional situation for women, and uh, by extension, women of color for a very long time. Thanks, Thomas. Thank you so much, Pamela. So I think we're transitioning. Um, uh, if our tech support will have it into the discussion, more open discussion portion of this. Um, so I think we will just proceed with that.